Well, hi there. I'm Sandy Alnock. I'm an artist, and today I'm going to talk about Olo alcohol markers. Sometimes my alcohol markers and I do crazy things like this piece that I did during an open studio Zoom this weekend. But today I just want to focus on a particular product. These are the brand new colors for Olo. They just came out today with 32 new ones. They're up to 160 now. And in my pre-order of the new colors, they sent me some treats. I got a pin and a sticker and they always send little connectors because these are half markers. We're going to talk about that and we're going to do some very simple art and I'm going to talk about how to choose colors. But if you're already somebody who knows how to use your Olos, you just want to see the new colors. I'm going to swatch these out for you. And if you see something you just got to go get, there's a link in the doobly-doo to go shopping, or you can just go see this chart on my blog and skip the rest of this video. It's going to be a little bit on the long side because I have a lot to say. I want to talk about the basics of the markers, refilling them, and a bunch of different ways to choose colors by using color theory, using the number system, using swatch charts, and conversion charts. And I'm going to talk in my next video more on conversion charts and get into detail. But some of the colors I'm most interested in here are at the end of the chart. These RV1s are a really nice natural blending group. They're going to blend nicely from the lights to the darks. They added a bunch of greens. They must have heard me whispering about how much more they needed in the greens category. So we got lots of new greens. There's a new blue green color, which is really pretty but the greens make me happy. And then the ones that really get me excited are the new blue violets. This is a blending group, again, a natural one that has a good range to it. And it's kind of a brighter, fresher purple than I've seen in other markers. So check this out on my blog if you want to just shop. And if you don't, stick around and we will get into the nitty gritty. So let's talk about what makes Olo markers unique. They're an alcohol marker, and if you're familiar with alcohol markers, they normally come in a full pen, and these come in a half pen, and you can customize them. You can put a chisel nib on one side and a brush nib on the other, or two brush nibs or two chisel nibs, and you just screw them together. They just come with this little connector, and you can put them together in any way you want. And I decided instead of having a chisel and a brush, since I used a brush far more than I ever do a chisel, I would just do two half markers of different colors. And I'll talk later about how I divide them up and, or pair them up. But each half marker is the equivalent of two full Copic markers. So the price is really good for these because of the amount of ink that they hold. And I'll show you in a minute as well how you refill them. You can also get new nibs for them and everything just like with lots of different alcohol markers. And as I said, mine have two different colors on either side. And I got the brush nibs for both of them because that's what I like to color with. So you can choose what works best for you. Now for marker refilling, it's a different process. Uh, some other brands will have a bottle that you buy and you put drops in it to refill it. And Olo markers, when they dry out like this, the one thing I don't like is you don't get a warning that they're drying out. So I had one that I rushed a few new uh, refills in because I was like, oh no, I need this color. So I bought this refill and that was a little container it comes as. And what you do is take out the nib that you have and I'm doing it with tweezers, but you can do it with your fingers. Just put some gloves on or something because it'll get ink on your hands. Take off the cap from the refill and basically you have another half marker right there. It's like the half marker without the nib. So you're just replacing your nib onto that one and using your old cap for it. So you're saving money with the refills. You get two markers worth of ink, two Copic markers worth of ink in that refill and it's gonna last you a good long time, but you use your same basic connector and your same basic cap and nib. So they're less expensive than buying a new marker. And right away it, you know, sends ink down into the nib and you can start working with it. You just dispose of what was left from the old marker, the empty container, and you're ready to go. Even though they do create some garbage, I kind of like that they're much easier to fill up than dealing with drops. 
So let's talk about the color families that Olo has. They're similar to some other markers you may have used. There's blacks and zero. Now blacks, I think you really only need one, but they have a blue black and a black black and a red black. I only use the black black, the K one, so you can choose whatever you want. And then the zero marker you're going to want. I love their zero marker. They have cool, warm, and red gray families. Red gray is unique to them, I believe. I haven't seen them in other brands. And again, I'm not sure if you'll need it. I usually make do with cools and warms in my work, but that's up to you. Now, yellow green is a family that was smaller. It's been expanded, which is nice. There are some desaturated colors and some brighter saturated ones. We're gonna talk about saturation here in a minute. Orange red family is the biggest family out of all of them. And if you're thinking of them as just being orange and red, look at the variety here. They go from very pale, like a super pale skin tone, to a deep dark brown. And the orange reds have that kind of variety in them. You're gonna see different amounts of it. The orange color family is smaller, but it has some saturated ones, some bright colors. It has some desaturated ones. Um, it has a true orange in it, but it's got these other brownish and red brownish kinds of colors. And then some that are practically grayish browns. And those are desaturated colors. And that means they're not bright. They're unsaturated. If you think of um, saturation as just that intensity of color. And next up we have the yellow and the yellow orange family. Now they're both pretty small, but look at the variety we have. The yellow goes down to those kind of greenish brownish colors, very dark ones. And the yellow oranges also have like a brown and orange, a kind of dirty yellow, etc. The red color family has things that are orangey looking within it. And it also has some pale colors like pinks and peaches. And it also goes down to very deep, dark colors as well. So every time you pick colors, you're choosing your saturation and your value. So it's good to have a variety in each of the color families. So look at those really nice dark, dark reds. They're practically browns and they'll sit in the brown family in a little while when I show you the hex chart. The red violets, are mostly bright colors. There are not any desaturated ones really in their line as of yet. And I'll tell you later how you're gonna find out if there's desaturated ones, but right now it's just because they're bright colors and bright colors indicate that they are saturated. And the reds and red violets together are very similar. You can see some similarity in the colors between them. So remember, you can always use colors that are next to each other on the color wheel because they're gonna to go together pretty well. So the violet family goes from deep and dark and saturated to pale, pale lavender types of colors. Some of them are looking very pink and they'll work with the pinks as well as working with more purpley types of colors. The blue violets just got expanded by a whole color family, which was nice. And I like the range here too. They're, they go from really darks to middles that are more like a blue sometimes than they are a blue violet. And the, you know, really darks are just super darks. I, I just love range in any of my art materials because I like contrast in my work. But some of the really pale colors can look like a blue as well. The blue family is a little smaller, but it's got some variety that also leans not only into the blue violets, but some of their colors lean more into being a blue green. And as you start working with these colors, you can start pairing them with colors that are in the blue green family if you wanna push something more to the blue green. So blue green also has some nice saturated colors, but it has some really nice desaturated ones too. A distant mountain might be a desaturated blue green in a scene. And it's really helpful to have something like that with a nice range to it. The green color family is still pretty small. It's got more in it than it did at first, which was why I had some complaints about like, I want some more greens, but they do have many more in this collection now. It was just really meager before. But when you add to the green colors, all of the yellow greens, then we really get going somewhere. So this is the greens and the yellow greens together. And look at all of that variety for making all kinds of green scenes. 
Now, I told you I was going to tell you about pairing half markers. What I did for this whole exercise for this video was take all of my markers apart and I put them in piles by family, by color family. And then I just kind of stood them on end and I looked at them to see, okay, if there's two numbers that are pretty close to each other, I'm going to put them on a marker together because then if I'm looking in my container at one end of it and, you know, there's an 027, then I know that if I'm looking for the 025, it might be on the other side of it. And that way I'm at least kind of triggering my brain if I find a color that's near it in the color system. You might find that you want to put a color that shades a color better on one end than the other. Like if you find a particular pairing that you like to use. But the great thing about these is you can take them apart and put them back together and redo them anytime you want. They're, it's really easy to do. Now I had two colors that were left over because my color families had more colors in, in them than something that was even. So I have one marker that I'm calling my Christmas marker. And I just know that it has my R1.5 on it and it has my G01 on it. And I just have to remember that because they're not related to each other at all. Now we're gonna take a fast peek at Olo's color wheel. A lot of different marker brands use a color wheel very similar to this. And this one was downloaded from their website, but they hadn't got the new one up for the, that includes the new colors. So this one is incorrect as of today, but I thought it would be helpful to show you what the saturation level is and how that plays out in your colors. So on the outside of the wheel, they start with the saturated colors and the saturated are the bright ones, the intense colors. Then when you get to the inner ring, you get into desaturated colors. And as this goes around, you're gonna see how the inside has all these kind of grayish, brownish, dirtyish looking colors on it. Now, some people will only work in the saturated end of the color wheel and you have no interest in those darker colors and that is totally fine. I like to make things that are realistic. And in real life, a lot of times you don't get that super bright screaming orange pumpkin you get a pumpkin that's a more muted color and you might need some of that pop of the bright color but the main thing you're going to be using is going to be a little dimmer of an orange to make a pumpkin look right or if you're drawing an apple you might want to make it so that it's got some desaturated shadows in it so i use them together both saturated and desaturated but it's helpful to know which you're using and which you're selecting when it comes to choosing your colors. And you can choose that not just by looking at this chart. Now you can download this chart for free from the Olo website and color it up and hopefully they will have the new one out by the time you end up watching this video. If not, they will have it shortly thereafter, I'm sure. It was a little hard to read for me. I have really terrible eyes right now and the letters are really small. So I was like zooming into the PDF on my computer while I was sitting coloring it on my desk. But you know, you can put all your colors in here and know which ones they say are saturated or desaturated. But I am gonna show you a better way to know that than doing this chart. But you're welcome to do this chart because it might help you to start understanding a few things about the colors. Now, something like these blues, when you look at the two columns of blues, because there's different groupings of colors, you can see the one on the left leans more toward like a purplish kind of bluish color. The other one is more like a blue greenish type of color in the, the second blue column. And you can tell that, especially when you look at the blue greens, because you have bluish blue greens on the left and greenish blue greens on the right. And it's going to be really easy to blend when you're using the blues that are on the blue green half and the blue greens that are on the blue half. And you can see that very clearly from something like a wheel like this. But as I said, there's other better ways to know that a lot of it is just experience. And that's what I have a lot of. And I don't need a lot of charts like this, but I know a lot of people do. And especially if you're just getting started in alcohol markers because they're a whole different animal if you're used to water-based markers. Trying to get used to them can be a real challenge. Now, one of the things that Olo did was put all of the grays on the inside and they put the cool grays on the cool half of the color wheel and the warm grays on the warm half. And then they put the red grays, the ones that have a reddish tone to them in the red and like 
uh, red violet sections just to remind you that they are those. And then they put the red black in that section as well. They put, um, I was trying to figure out what they were doing. They put the blue black in the blue section and I didn't know where they put the black black. So I just filled in the rest of it because I needed somewhere to put my black on my chart. So you can download that chart for free on the Ola website. But I have some other options that you can consider as well as you're trying to get to know your colors. But I'm going to start off with some coloring just because a video that is all about charts is not nearly as fun as a video that has some coloring in it. So I have made a sketch and I'm going to try out one of these handles. When I ordered my refill for that other marker I showed you, I also ordered a handle just to see what these are all about. You could get one of these for each of your markers and then put them all in a cup or whatever container so you're only looking at one end when you're searching for your marker instead of two ends. And I tried it out. I wanted to see how it felt in, in, as a drawing experience and I didn't find it was particularly different than working with a full marker aside from if if you would like to put one of these on each of your pens. It's entirely up to you, but I might get like six or eight of them so I could get out a bunch of colors that I'm going to use for a particular project and put them on that and then restore my markers to their normal partners. But I don't really know if I'll do that or not, but it's uh, kind of a personal decision as an artist what you want to do. So I am coloring a marker and these are uh, black markers. I'm coloring it all black because my pens are all brush nibs. If you end up getting half brush and half chisel, then half your pen will be gray and half your pen will be black, which makes it really obvious which end you're uncapping. Other markers, the both ends look the same and it's a little more difficult to figure out which end to open. So that is a nice thing that they have done. They've thought through a lot of interesting details with Olo markers as they develop these because like every other marker brand that I've been trying, because I've been trying to find something that is better than Copic, and I just haven't found anything that's inventive. And Olo is inventive in just the way that they're approaching the delivery of the markers. Now for blending colors, the left side here, I'm using analogous colors. They're ones right next to each other on the color wheel, but then suddenly I jump from a pale yellow into a strong orange and had to use some peach to try to blend it. And then I decided to just intensify the yellow so that it would go more with the orange color. And then I intensified the pink on the other side. And I tried to make them all about equal in their saturation and their, their value so that they would blend nicely. Now, when you're choosing colors, natural blending groups are the easiest for new colorists to use. So I'm just gonna highly recommend using this little process here. This looks just at the numbers. We're not looking at the round chart that we looked at before. We wanna look at the letter and the two digits of the number on the marker. The letter, you wanna choose something that's either the same letter for all three of your markers you wanna use for blending or whatever, however many you're gonna be using. You know, use the violet and the blue violet or the yellow, orange, and the orange. Something same as each other or nearby. So all blue greens, or blue greens with a green. Then you wanna look at the first digit and that's the saturation, that intensity of color. And you wanna use the same intensity rather than trying to, you know, work across far too many different things. If you take a really bright yellow and try to mix it with a very, very dingy yellow, it's gonna be harder to blend. But if you start using everything with the first digit the same, that's going to be the easiest blending. However, Olu Markers is new enough that they don't have a full family in each one of the color groups. It's one of the reasons I'm excited about that RV family and the BV family that they just released because they have the same first digit and they have a good range of value in the second digit. So that's what we're gonna talk, talk about now. The value is the amount of light and dark. So the lighter values have a zero, a one, or a two. The medium have a three, a four, or a five. And the darks have a six, seven, eight, or nine. And that gives you a range. And you could do a smaller range. You don't have to do the full range, but as you're starting, it's helpful to have that full range and choose one from a light, one from medium, one from a dark, a couple digits away from each other, at least a little bit. 
And that way you're choosing by looking at the numbers. Now I know some people, their mind melts down. They can't remember which number did Sandy say to use. Just remember the first thing is the color family, trying to have that be the same or similar. The saturation you want to have the same or similar. And then the only place you want a vast difference is in the value. You want to have like you know, two or three steps in between each one so that you can get a range of value. And that's what's going to give you dimension when you're coloring something. So you want to have some dimension, then stretch that value. But the rest of them, you can break all these rules, but if you break them, then it's going to be more difficult to blend. That's all. I can blend pretty much anything if I put my mind to it, but I try to blend things that I know are going to work. Now, another way that you can choose colors is with a hex chart. And I have been making these hex charts for quite a number of years, and a lot of people have been using them and loving them. And what I have done is taken all the colors in a line of markers. The Olo one was just updated. So if you already purchased the chart, you can just go to your account and re-download it. And the new one will be there. You don't have to email me or anything. If you end up not getting that one though, then let me know, but it should just be there for you. Now, when you order a hex chart, it's a chart of the colors in visual order. What I tried to do was put colors together and if possible and it's not always possible because it's not a complete range of colors that has every variation in between but I tried to put colors of similar values and similar saturation as near as possible to each other so you'll be able to find them when you're looking for them sometimes you'll have to jump over a color or two and that's usually the best way to find something that's going to be a far apart enough in value just kind of do some hopscotching over different numbers but you know there you can see there's some dark blues and there's some medium blues and blue greens and then you can just find a light one when it gets to the top part of that section there's a little corner down here where I've put some desaturated blue greens those desaturated ones are the ones that you can use for that distant mountain but they don't really go with some of the other colors. So I kept them together in their own little natural blending group in that bottom corner. So that's why some of them are set off to the side when I put together a hex chart because it's just impossible to do these and get everything in the right place. Each one of these, when I do any updates, I just have to print it out and color it and then you know make arrows for myself, move this one here and move that one there and then switch it all around on my computer and then do it again. I have tried the suggestion that so many people have said, well, why don't you just you know, cut out all the hexagons and arrange them? When you color them next to each other, it looks very different than when you're just laying pieces of paper on the table, because I tried that before and it just didn't work. I kind of have to see it and then let the whole sheet of paper dry and look at it the next day and go, is that good enough? No, that one dried a little differently because alcohol in the pens will evaporate from the paper and the color changes just a little bit. So with your artwork as well, you might wanna look at it the next day and see if it needs any adjustment. And there's also the fact that any line of colors that doesn't have a complete you know, transition from every color, it's gonna be almost impossible to make every jump between colors look great so sometimes there's a color that's really dark next to a color that's a light medium and there's just not a whole lot I can do about it but I try as best as I can to put these charts together to help you to choose your colors now some people will also print out an extra version of this chart to remind themselves of which colors they have and which refills they have so if you buy some refills ahead of time so that you don't end up like me with a color suddenly running out and like, oh no, now I have to order one. I can't finish my project until it comes in because that's one drawback of these markers is that they can run out on you really fast and they don't give you advanced warning. They don't just like slowly dry up. I find that when they're done, they're done. And <laughs> like, wow, that was quick. So if you want to purchase say an extra refill for the colors that you have, so it's on hand, print out a chart and mark it that this is the ones I have refills for, mark the date on it, or put a sticky note on top of each one of those colors 
to tell yourself you do have one or two refills or whatever. But these markers do last pretty long if you're not coloring a thousand charts like I have been. I am going to have to order me some refills after all of these charts. Oh my goodness. But remember, each half a marker is basically the same amount of ink as two Copic markers. So just coloring one chart is not going to kill your markers. I've just been doing it a lot. So the hex chart comes with a black and white version. You can print out on your favorite coloring paper. Always print it on that so that you get an accurate representation of what your markers will look like. It also comes with a color version. While printing out the color hex chart or this color conversion chart is not going to result in an accurate type of printout because it goes from my scanner to my computer to your computer to your printer, it's good enough that you can tell a few things. One of which is if you're using the hex chart to try to see which colors you want to buy next. Don't buy things that look like they're about the same color. They're too close together because you want some difference in your colors. You want to go from lights to darks. So skip over a few and buy something maybe a little bit different. I'm going to talk more about conversion charts in general and using this one as a specific example, but in general, how to use conversion charts and how to interpret the results that you're getting. Now you can go get the hex chart through a link in the doobly-doo. You can sign up for the alcohol marker jumpstart class, which includes that graphic. Then you will be able to download it and color it yourself. The Copic to Olo and Olo to Copic conversion chart is free. That's on my website, link in the doobly-doo. And then of course, if you want to go to Olo's website and get their circular color chart, you can download that. Probably by this time they have the extra colors added in, but don't bother coloring it till all the colors are added in that circle. All right, that's it for me. You have easily earned a break. So I'm going to suggest that you go do some art now. Just go make something because you've sat here for 27 minutes listening to me ramble. <laughs> I will talk to you next time when we talk about conversion charts. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a thing. I'll see you later.